All right, I'm excited to talk to you today about using wisdom to bridge political divides. Most of this work has been done in the lab by Curtis Purrier, um, who is not only in the lab, but also in the Center for the Science of Moral Understanding. So uh, thanks for having me, uh, at least on this video doc. Um, now, I probably don't have to tell you that America is in a tough spot right now. The liberals and conservatives have a hard time agreeing on almost anything, uh, which makes it hard to have right, reasonable government or uh, civil conversations over the Thanksgiving table, for instance. And so there's been a, a fair amount of research done on political intolerance and our political and moral divides. Some work suggests that we are actually closer than we think. Um, on one hand, uh, this is great because it makes us realize we're actually not so far apart, but the fact that we think we're so far apart is a problem. And so we need skills, we need ways to kind of help us bridge that gap, both in our minds and in practice. And you only have to log on to uh, social media to find uh, not just elites being nasty to each other, whether that's Ted Cruz and AOC, but, or everyday people, right? So your uncle Jimmy and your aunt Jane are probably uh, saying nasty things on Facebook and, and Twitter, um, and that's not helping family functioning or your uh, the broader political discourse either, right? And so there's a fair amount of work on how we can help bridge these divides. So one thing we can do is kind of correct our misperceptions about the other side. So people think that the other side hates their side. Turns out they don't. We don't really hate the other side as much as we think, even if we do generally hate the other side, right? It's less than we think. Um, and so correcting that misconception uh, can be really powerful. We can also activate some kind of shared identity, right? We're all in this together, we're all Americans. Uh, and, and that helps sometimes, right? A common enemy maybe, we're all fighting uh, totalitarian regimes, maybe. We can have positive intergroup contact with the other side. So you can get together with someone who's a, a conservative if you're liberal or liberal if you're conservative and, and do something fun, right? And, and makes you realize that the, this person is not some inhuman monster, right? But another person, a reasonable person to hang out with and, and to talk about with politics. What we're interested in here in this talk is building uh, skills or really a, a way of approaching dialogue that can help foster uh, respect across divides. And so this builds on some recent work done by Mike Yeomans about kind of just signaling your recept receptivity uh, to the other side. And, and some of our work as well about focusing on kind of personal experiences, right? It's like how to structure our political conversations to encourage respect across divides. And so the strategy that we're building upon here is about seeming balanced in your conversation and not just balanced, but also uh, balanced for a particular aim. And we call that balanced pragmatism. And, and that idea really stems out uh, of work on wisdom. So uh, perspectival metacognition is a word that you've maybe heard before if you're a wisdom researcher. I wouldn't say it's like the most in intuitive uh, word, it's not the shortest word, but it is a, a really descriptive word, which is nice, right? So it, it's about a balance and also humility. It's about changing based on the context. It's about, you know, acknowledging that there's multiple perspectives, taking into account people's context uh, and their moral aspirations, right? So that there's a lot of kind of um, thinking about perspectival metacognition uh, and how it's really key to wisdom. Now, I know this a uh, survey came out about whether wisdom and morality were kind of like integral to each other. Um, I'm not going to touch on whether you actually need wisdom to be moral, but what I will suggest is that you need to seem wise. You need to use these kind of uh, wise techniques, particularly perspectival metacognition, so that other people see you as moral. And we'll get into that a little more uh, later, but that's really uh, what I think the issue is, right? The perception of morality is tied to the perception that you are wise, okay? And so what, what we do in this project is we take perspectival metacognition and we kind of take out parts of it to make it more applied to this kind of political context. And as I mentioned before, what we're focusing on is 
balanced pragmatism, right? So that means you're balancing viewpoints across the sides, right? So I think this, but the other side has a valid point about this. And so maybe we can find some kind of common ground, right? So it's not about emphasizing respect uh, necessarily or per se, but acknowledging that there's kind of truths on both sides related to wisdom and also tying it to something pragmatic, right? So we're all trying to achieve a goal here. And I understand that there's points on both sides and how are we gonna achieve this goal? Yeah, so, right, I wanna give a talk here. There's different ways to give a talk. Some people use one platform, some people use another. We're both here though to give a talk. And so this is what I'm gonna use, even though I might realize that there's other ways of doing it. I think this way is the best. Right? That's a kind of banal example. It's obviously uh, more interesting when we talk about politics. And so what we suggest is that when you use this kind of wisdom-based approach, balanced and uh, pragmatic in your conversations about politics, people will see you, your opponents will see you in particular, as more moral, more authentic, and more rational. And this perception will lead others to engage with you in a more civil and respectful fashion. So to uh, examine this idea, we paired with some folks at Polity, which is a, an organization um, that looks at ways to kind of bridge divides, ways to approach our political discourse in a new fashion. And their kind of interesting novel approach is using something called the decision point method. Now, this is a method, it's a, it's a scenario that you put people in. Uh, and, and in this scenario, what happens? Um, is you put the speaker in the driver's seat, right? So let's say decision point comes to me, the decision point scenario, and they say, Kurt, what I'd like you to do is to imagine yourself in this hypothetical political scenario. I want you to think about what the best solution is to the scenario and, and explain why you think that's the best solution. Yeah? Okay, so here's uh, the one example and the example that we'll be looking at today, right? So imagine that you're the chair of a presidential transition team you're the uh, staffing a senior level position in the administration. At the top of your list is Joe Page. Joe Page is a personal friend of the president-elect. Joe supported the president-elect early in the campaign. He also raised money for him. One day, an aide brings to you a video of a lecture that Joe Page gave five years ago, where he criticizes a policy almost identical to one of the president-elect's signature policies. You know that once this comes out, it will anger a lot of the president's supporter. And so the question is, you're in, the you're in the hot seat, right? You're making the decision. What would you do in this scenario? And so what polity does is asks policymakers and politicians to reason through these scenarios and give their answer on video. Yeah, so here's one example uh, of someone giving their answer. This is representative or past representative David Jolly, who used to represent uh, Florida for the uh, uh, Republican Party. The lecture Joe Page gave five years ago is a serious problem for the president-elect, and your job would be to extract any risk from the newly elected president. My recommendation is you do not hire Joe Page. You eliminate the risk. You eliminate the controversy. Because there is a personal relationship with the president-elect, I think you inform the president-elect of your decision and the reason why. And if Joe Page is to be hired, that is a decision by the president. Your job, if he decides to move forward, is to then provide a recommendation. And the recommendation in this case likely is to show that the president is open-minded, can accept criticism, wants criticism, wants diversity of opinion within his inner council. And that is the reason Joe Page is being hired. But it is not your decision to invite the controversy to the president-elect. That decision rests with the president-elect. OK. So there you saw. Uh, <laughs> all right, so there you saw uh, David Jolly kind of reasoning through this, right? And so as I, as I mentioned, this decision point method was really created so that you could see how policymakers reason through scenarios as a way of kind of evaluating their kind of uh, ability to think on their feet, their kind of depth of understanding about the political process and the kind of emotional intelligence involved in that. But it turns out that when you look at these videos, uh, some of the, the folks who are best at that are really showing this kind of balanced pragmatism. So uh, David Jolly mentioned 
right weighing considerations, the kind of pragmatic uh, issue of needing to select advisors and what the president wants. So when we saw this, we realized, look, there's balanced pragmatism here. Maybe we could partner with Polity, take some of these videos and see if they would help increase respect across the political divide to the extent to which they use this kind of balanced pragmatism approach uh, or conversational style. Okay, so here we go. Um, right, and so, right, uh, he makes a recommendation, right, uses some balance, uses some pragmatism. Uh, and so what we wondered is whether this might help foster uh, respect across the divide. And so uh, what we did in our first study with 300 people recruited from Mechanical Turk is we wondered whether the balanced pragmatism inherent in these decision point videos could increase respectful engagement with outgroup elites. That means if you're an MTurk participant and you are watching this video, this decision point video, um, and you compare it to um, a news clip with the same politician, or a campaign ad with the same politician, right? So it's all the same person, all the same kind of, right, like glossy production stuff, right? Where you're trying to uh, showcase the viewpoints of a particular policymaker. Uh, so it's controlled for that. Uh, and, and they're all naturalistic, right? So policymakers are often on news clips. They're often in campaign ads, right? Uh, and here we want to see whether this decision point video could help increase respect across the divide. And so uh, what we found as a manipulation check is that these decision point videos were rated higher in balanced pragmatism uh, and perspectival metacognition, right? So they were indeed uh, better at eliciting this kind of perspectival metacognition, this wisdom, this balanced pragmatism than the kind of control videos of news clips and campaign ads. And this made uh, uh, political opponents, so those on the other side, view this policymaker as more moral uh, and more authentic and more rational. Now, these things all uh, through mediation pattern predicted more respectful engagement. So people rated um, in the operationalizations here, um, right, thought that they would respect the views of this politician more, respect them more and be considered of this politician's stances, although they were on the opposite side, right? So, uh, and again, this is mediated by morality, whether they saw them as a good person, authenticity, whether they saw them as true themselves uh, and rational, whether they saw themselves as smart. And so here uh, is the full mediation uh, pathway. So balanced pragmatism leads to morality, authenticity and rationality, which leads to respectful engagement. And so we uh, replicated this across a number of different replications. Uh, using uh, one case just campaign ads versus uh, wisdom or balanced pragmatism or a news clip versus balanced pragmatism. And then in, in study one, we did both of them. So you can see here that the effect is quite robust across replications and across various control conditions. So in summary, what we found is that balanced pragmatism of the decision point videos appears to increase uh, respectful engagement with outgroup elites. Now, we will also wonder, can we leverage these results? Can we leverage the success of balanced pragmatism in these particular videos, right? These kind of like, admittedly a small sample uh, of videos. Can we use them so everyday people might be more uh, likely to elicit respect in political discourse? And so for these next two studies, ran two more studies, we wondered whether balanced pragmatism could be the key to increasing respectful uh, dialogue in everyday uh, interactions. These were written comments. So in study, one, study two, what we did was we tried to get everyday people to write comments in a way that, that embodied balanced pragmatism uh, about politically, a politically divisive issue, in this case, immigration. And then in study three, we wanted to see whether the comments that were written in a balanced pragmatic way would increase respectful engagement. So you can see here that we kind of like fed study two, the outputs of study two, which is the comments that people wrote, into study three is the stimuli, and then people evaluated those stimuli. And we wondered, would the kind of comments written in terms of balanced pragmatism increase respect relative to other comments? 
All right, so in study two and three, we focused on uh, comments about immigration, which was a pretty hot button topic uh, at the time of running these studies. I mean, it is now as well, but it was especially a uh, hot button at the time. And so we had three conditions for having folks or participants write comments. One, we instructed them to write uh, comments that were wise using balanced pragmatism. So we asked them explicitly consider multiple stances on immigration, recognize the limits of your own knowledge and describe a workable solution that addresses everyone's concerns. The second condition between subjects was analytic thinking, right? Write something that shows your ability to think logically about the issues and put together a cohesive argument. Now, analytic is usually what we think of when we think about encouraging discourse, right? Uh, a debate, thinking rationally, thinking critically, right? When you think about uh, open discourse and free speech, it's usually this kind of like uh, uh, analytic thinking that we encourage uh, in our students and in other people, right? We want this kind of like logical, coherent, like a good argument, a good argument. The third part, the third condition was just respect, right? Just try your best to, to do whatever you can to make your opponent respect you most. Now, this third condition, respect, it, it is likely right what's going to lead to the most respect, right? Because that's your explicit goal. But it's not always uh, as true to the kind of um, debate or discourse, right? Where you're like sticking to your guns, you're trying to trying to argue for your position. Uh, and so, what we think is that wisdom, the balanced pragmatism, might kind of be somewhere in between these things, right? It might be effective at bridging divides, but also be seen as, as generally analytic, right? As generally sticking to your points, as generally true to your own views uh, while increasing respect. So, we're hoping it's the kind of best of both worlds. And so, participant wrote comments uh, uh, about immigration in one of these three conditions. And then they forecasted how much their comment would um, right, be seen as embodying kind of balanced pragmatism or perspectival metacognition. And as you can see on the bars on the left, right, the, the, the balanced pragmatism, the wise comments were seen as participants as likely to be rated as highest. Right? This is kind of like a manipulation check in some sense. right? We asked them to write something that was balanced pragmatism, and they thought that the balanced pragmatism comments would be highest in that. Okay, so far so good. Um, the easy to write is interesting. That's the middle bar, right? The folks in the balanced pragmatism were significantly lower. And this is interesting, right? I mean, on one hand, we maybe want it to be easy to write these comments because that would to make it uh, adopted most wide scale. On the other hand, there's a reason that people probably aren't doing this in the first place, right? People are like, I can be analytic, right? Like that's high, I can be analytic, I can argue against the other person, but they find it really hard to be like, let's be balanced and think of a solution. We're thinking that this is the best way to kind of increase the civility of, of uh, discourse and to hopefully right, reach political solutions for, uh, for real world issues. But it's not easy, right? It's not easy. And so we maybe need to encourage people to do this if it's effective. Um, and people thought that each of these, uh, on the bars on the right, each of these uh, uh, attitudes or tacts, analytic, uh, wise, and respectful, were most likely to, to increase respect. There's, these are not significantly different from each other, OK? And so we had uh, research assistants blind, blind to hypothesis, code these comments. They coded them in terms of, of wisdom slash balanced pragmatism slash perspectival metacognition. There's lots of words that refer to the same thing here. Or analytic thinking, right? Uh, or uh, respect, right? So wisdom, they could see both sides. Analytic thinking, right? They're like really thinking about it. They're reasoning. Respect is polite, is tolerant, is kind. And so uh, the balanced pragmatism, you can see here, right, in yellow, right? I can see both sides. Right, a country needs borders and immigration laws. Right, this person is in the kind of like let's increase immigration condition. Right, but they're acknowledging that there are uh, there's truth on both sides. They acknowledge that even though they want to increase immigration, a country needs borders and immigration laws, and they're being pragmatic. Right, maybe what we need to do is have an avenue where people can become citizens while also increasing border security. Right, so some kind of like uh, acknowledgments of the pragmatic concerns. So uh, again, this is a liberal person talking about uh, their views, their pro-immigration views, while also trying to be uh, balanced and pragmatic. 
Okay, here is someone who uh, is analytic, who is a, a, a conservative person supporting their view, right? So they start with a kind of like historical premise. Many people have immigrated legally to the US. Then they say, right in yellow, I believe that all people have the right to immigrate here by legal means, right? Emphasizing like, let's make this distinction here between illegal and legal immigration. And then makes the argument, right? The kind of um, the uh, analogy, right? We would not expect to go to another country ourselves and not abide by their laws, right? A reasonable claim, right? We, we wouldn't expect to visit another country and not abide by their laws, right? So we've got this analytic approach here by, by a, a more conservative participant. And here we've got uh, a respectful comment, and this is by um, right by someone who's pro-immigration. Right, I respect your position. I would never want anyone to feel like they're not welcomed anywhere. Uh, I want everyone to appreciate uh, and bond, thus loving each other. Right. So this is really explicit. Like, I just want the best for the world. Like, can't we all just get along, kumbaya, kind of thing a little bit? Right. Uh, I want people to feel good. So uh, you can see these different comments. Right. Uh, and so what, what we show here is in the coding, right, it turns out that when people are instructed to be uh, analytic, you see the red bars, they're really good at it. When they're instructed to be respectful, pretty good at it. And when they're instructed to be wise, they're okay good at it, right? Th this is, again, uh, illustrating that it's kind of difficult to do the kind of balanced pragmatism that we instructed. So really, like, consider both sides and be pragmatic. It's tough, right? Uh, and again, I think that's because, you know, we don't have practice with this, uh, but I think that perhaps we should. So uh, that's how many people did it. And here are the correlations between, uh, between the coders. I think this is interesting, right? So there's no real correlation between who's wise, balanced pragmatism and analytic, but there's a pretty decent correlation between the wise balanced pragmatism and respect, suggesting that using this balanced pragmatic approach leads people to see it uh, as increasing respect while also searching for uh, searching for a solution which i think is, is is important all right so in study two we found that people can use balanced pragmatism in their comments it's hard though uh, and that there's some naturalistic overlap with respect and balanced pragmatism now you might think well why don't we just use respect uh, if people can do respect easier uh, and it seems to be Right, useful in building respect. Well, again, I think uh, there's a benefit of trying to be pragmatic and trying to solve problems. Uh, and the, the respectful comment, um, while it's useful, right, it doesn't necessarily kind of push this dialogue forward or stick uh, as, as true to your kind of like policy positions as you might think, right? It doesn't really acknowledge both sides as much as just like, let's get along. And I think when we're encouraging civil discourse and debate, there's something useful about kind of acknowledging the sides and sticking to your own uh, while focusing on a solution. All right, so in this final study, we wondered whether balanced pragmatic comments could encourage respectful engagement from political opponents. And we contrasted uh, the kind of analytic things that people often think you should use or often do use in conversations from balanced pragmatism. So we got a subset of comments from study two right, a couple balanced pragmatism and a couple analytic. We took ones that were high in respect, right? So they're already respectful uh, in general, but we wanna see after kind of controlling for respectfulness, uh, which of these comments was more likely to increase uh, uh, civil engagement and, and make the, the speaker seem like a reasonable conversational partner. Uh, and also increase respect towards the outgroup party, right? That's kind of like, big important thing. Can we get people to respect the other side if someone from the other side used this kind of comment? All right, so participants saw four comments, two from political in-group, two from the political out-group, we'll mostly focus on the out-group here, and two were uh, analytic and two were wise or balanced pragmatism, right? Again, all comments were, uh, were above a threshold of respect. They're above the midpoint of respect. They weren't uh, super different. Again, the balanced pragmatism was often a little bit higher uh, on respect than analytic, but, but we're talking here like a, a, a half a scale point difference in a seven point scale. So it was pretty minor compared to the differences, whether it's analytic uh, versus wise. And so what we found is that the wise comment compared to the analytic comment uh, really drove perceptions of morality, really drove perceptions of rationality. Again, similar levels of respect 
and drove respectful engagement more, which I think is pretty, pretty important. And this is the most interesting result, I think. Uh, let's see, move my slide. Pick a person to talk with, yeah? So people uh, got to say kind of like who they wanted to speak with uh, after this uh, study. And so what you found is very few people wanted to talk with the, the outgroup person who was using the analytic, right? Like, I'm going to use arguments to argue against you, and they're going to be good arguments, and, and I'm going to shut down your arguments uh, with my reasoning. Uh, more people wanted to talk to the analytic person uh, in their uh, own group, but interestingly, right, the number uh, of folks who wanted the outgroup member who used balanced pragmatism was not different from the uh, analytic in group or uh, wise in group, right? So if you're an outgroup member and you use this kind of balanced pragmatism, people are equally likely to want to talk to you as an in-group member. I think that's pretty compelling. That's pretty compelling. So. Study three in conclusion, balanced pragmatism increases respectful engagement and willingness to discuss with political opponents, um, which I think is pretty important in America today. So across three studies, we found that the kind of naturalistic balanced pragmatism found in these decision point videos increased respectful engagement towards cross-party elites. In study two, we found that people can, with effort, uh, write the kind of balanced pragmatic uh, comments on a controversial issue. And these, is these comments are in general respectful. In study three, we found that balanced pragmatism when compared with analytic comments, increased respectful engagement across the aisle. Now, I don't think this is, you know, there's any easy solutions for political uh, uh, disagreement in America today, but I do think that balanced pragmatism can help us frame our conversations and frame our uh, disagreements in a way that can lead to more respectful uh, uh, political engagement. So I think, right, wisdom holds the key when it comes to perceptions of morality and authenticity and rationality, right? So more than just morality. When someone uses balanced pragmatism, which is tied to perspectival metacognition, right, they seem to be rational and moral and authentic. And that leads people to want to engage with them in, in a civil and respectful fashion. And that is all I've got. So thanks to you for listening. Thanks to Polity for helping us use their videos. And thanks to Curtis Purrier who did uh, all this work. Uh, thanks very much.